because because we're trying to help people obviously but how we can understand why people might not want to trade in their benefits and especially their housing benefits for you know what could be a, a relatively modest income at work but that's accompanied by a huge rent bill that makes the work seem you know like it wasn't a good idea in the first place Welcome back to Partner Conversations, a series of interviews from the Edinburgh Trust where we learn more about the work of our partners across the city and the challenges faced by the people they support. My name is Ems Harrington and I'm the Edinburgh Trust Senior Partnership Development Officer. Today I'm speaking with Mark Phillips from Access to Industry, a charity that works with individuals to support them into education and employment. So, can we start by you introducing yourself and let me know what organisation that you work for? Certainly. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today, Ems. My name's uh, Mark Phillips. <clears throat> I'm a service manager with local third sector organisation Access to Industry. Thanks so much, Mark. Can you tell me a bit about the work that your organisation does? Okay. Uh, well, where, where do I start? Uh, Come, come next year, it'll be a quarter of a century of access to industry. And uh, our, the organisation started small in the west of Edinburgh as a, a, a kind of cottage industry working with the, the local college to, to provide uh, access opportunities to some of the people in that part of Edinburgh to do some creative work. And since then, it's grown into... Uh, a much larger and uh, hopefully punchy a uh, concern of around about 40 or so staff members working across several local authorities including Edinburgh and Eastern Midlothian. The uh, main premise of the work is to help people into opportunities uh, be they work, training, education but you know some of the work we do is uh, involved in simply just looking after people so they can possibly wake up one day ready for the kind of opportunities I just mentioned. Uh, that's really about it in a nutshell. That's great, thanks. So what is your role and if you could share a bit about what your role entails? Okay, well I joined Access to Industry in 2008, having worked very closely with them since uh, 2003 as a an addiction worker, uh, feeding the people that I was supporting into uh, Access to Industry's opportunities. Uh, for large part of my early career there, I was one of the caseworkers uh, supporting uh, people coming out of prison, rehab, uh, hostels, etc., into jobs, into classes, and just generally, you know, uh, addressing the the barriers that perhaps needed uh, help with to get them to that point. Uh, but since since uh, the last decade or so, I've been one of the managers in the team. And uh, uh, really, it's about making sure that the teams are looked after themselves, know, know what to do, uh, know how to work with the people we support, know what we need to do to keep the doors open, know what we need to do to uh, change with the times and to attract you know the right kind of people comfortably into into the project, and to make sure that they're looked at after on the way out. Uh, uh, so all the other more mundane things, you know, helping with recruiting and you know some of the uh, administrative things that go on behind the scenes. Although there are, there are people far better than me at doing that, but you know I'll contribute where I can. So so really, it's about making sure that the projects that we run are doing what we tell the funders that uh, we plan to do with them. So that's great. And what projects um, do you run? Like that, would you be responsible for you and your team? Well, the the one that's been the most consistent and the one that's probably I, people most people identify access to industry with is uh, the Encompass project, which uh, was formerly known as the Transition Project till uh, about six or seven years ago, and that's the, been the the mainstay since uh, access to industry moved into the city, and its client group is is mainly people in recovery nice to be using the word recovery because we mm. didn't we just talked about addiction when we started sure, so it's yeah. it's nice that you know the kind of the, the zeitgeist has actually kind of followed us in that respect where we're talking about people uh you know 
uh, using uh, the labour market, using education and, and all these kind of things is, is a means to help them get better rather than it being an, a means and an end in, in its, itself. So, uh, but also people coming out of prison uh, in, in my time with access to industry, we've developed, you know, a lot of positive work in Edinburgh Prison and in the Young Offenders Institute uh, and, and elsewhere at times too. Uh, but we also work with people who are homeless. Uh, our location in the Cowgate, in the centre of town, and in proximity to lots of hostels and everything yeah. is, is helpful too, uh, mm -hmm. as is the fact that just in general, our centrality, because it's not all that far for any, we don't have any kind of kind of tribal link with any uh, of the, you know, the, the outlying parts of the city where a lot mm -hmm. of the people that we support come from. So. Mm -hmm. But we also, you know, uh, have an interest in looking after and supporting the uh, Access Progress Project, which is a, a project that uh, has uh, developed from the priority of supporting parents. So on paper, perhaps less vulnerable, but, you know, certainly on paper, just as needy people that are trying to return from the work, you know, from, from a period of looking after the kids to thinking about, you know, returning back to, to work or, or doing so for the first time. Uh, interestingly and, and heart, hearteningly, quite a lot of the people that we support from that project are people that are from other uh, parts of the world. And it's been a real learning experience to, to look after and, and learn from you know, people from, from other cultures too. Uh, and also similarly, one of the emerging priorities locally and nationally is, is to increase people's awareness of uh, data and digital learning and digital skills and everything. So we've actually been a part of that. We've got some, again, some excellent staff, you know, that know far more than I do about that type of work that are, uh, you know, working with the local college and, and, and other people to to bring new people in to, to learn new mm -hmm. things. And, and in doing so, we learn about these things too. So if you'd been speaking to me five, ten years ago, I would have been a much more of a one-dimensional answer to that question yeah. but you know there's there's all sorts of uh, client groups emerging now that all have equal merit and you know mm -hmm. we all are, 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 are the nice thing is when they all work and study together because that's the way it should be in a community absolutely <clears throat> that's loads of stuff fantastic mm -hmm. um so in your experience or and in the experience of your team how have things changed since the 2020 uh, COVID pandemic and with the, you know, well, current rising cost of living? What impact have you seen on like the people that you support and on your organisation as well? Oh my goodness. Uh, I know it's a, it's a really big question. It's a, that's a, that's either a really stumbling monosyllabic answer like I'm about to give you or it's a 45 minute uh, <laughs> lecture on the subject <laughs> yeah. but you want something in between so uh -huh. I'd, I'd say it's a little difficult now because I think we're I think things have kind of recalibrated a bit since sure. uh, you know I'll I'll admit when we were talking before before we switched the tape on here we were talking about the you know how interesting it is that people don't speak to each other on the phone anymore some people tend to thrive with video conferencing. Some people are, you know, sick of it mm -hmm. too. So I suppose there's that. Some people have found it's a godsend as far as family life and, you know, pet life <laughs> and, and things like that. To, mm -hmm. You know, so, so just like anything, there's been almost too many aspects to... To put into one punchy, punchy wee answer, I, I think it's. I, I, I think in this kind of situation, you have to take the positives. We have to, you know, I, I could moan about the things that you know bother me about it and other things like that. But I think, I think it's just given us more options to play with, mm -hmm. uh, saving time, saving money. Uh, yes, the downside is that perhaps you know. The, the kind of human touch is being lost more and more yeah. professionally with people. Cer certainly, personally, if I'm in a video conferencing situation, I'll, I'll just because of the way I'm, I'll, I'll lose interest far quicker in mm -hmm. this kind of uh, that format. And that's, you know, 
that's that's a challenge. Uh, as far as other aspects of post pandemic, obviously there's been real changes in the labour market, and with us being an employability organisation, that's significant too. Yeah. That uh, you know there's there's it looks different to what it did now. Uh, mm. The pandemic period has also coincided with Brexit too, mm. and the the challenges and and you know some say uh, opportunities that that bring as well. So, so so you might sometimes find that there's there's a mixture of things going on be between the two when it comes to you know work and everything like that. Uh, the perhaps we could talk about the pandemic all we like mm -hmm. and the post pandemic a uh, reality, but you know, in amongst that is obviously the the difficulty people have in making ends meet and and the amount of uh, poverty there is now that's probably more significant than mm -hmm. than the pandemic perhaps or perhaps the pandemic's contributed to that but mm -hmm. i'd say that's probably been the most telling thing that that we encounter and are challenged by is the uh, just how difficult it is for our, our students our clients to to uh, to get by but also our staff yeah so do you think that they would be the main challenges in your work I would say I would say they are. Uh, obviously, if we're working with people who are disadvantaged because of addiction and, and because of uh, criminal justice involvement, uh, having offended whether they've been in prison or, or whether they they were able to avoid that, obviously those are those are problems because these aren't things that are. Uh, what you would call protected characteristics you know yeah. there's no nothing in the qualities act about you know the things that happened to you in your childhood sure. that, that got you a, a criminal record in your youth and then worse as you grow older there's not there's no protected characteristic for you know having a drug problem that may have came came alongside you know that uh, period of offending so because of that, it's it's, in the, it's always in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. So if we're talking about opportunities and things, you know, that's it's a there's a real genuine stigma, and and it's backed up often by genuine barriers that people will face because of people's judgment and them, regardless of what's on their CV. You know, uh, a criminal record has never helped anybody get a job apart from in some quirky, unique situations. You know, where you maybe uh, where maybe it's a necessity. So I'd I'd say you know, having thought about you know the questions you'd ask, that's certainly been one of the things that challenges us the most because people come with low low expectations because they uh, you know they, they they fear that they've got they're two nil behind before they start because of uh, you know things that they've uh, encountered. Whereas in reality, people should actually often be congratulated for still being alive. Never, Absolutely. Never mind, yeah. uh, you know, uh, further punished for yeah. anything that they've had to do in the course of trying to survive. Absolutely. That's a really important point, and I'm, I'm actually very glad and grateful that you brought that up. I think that's really important. I also want to acknowledge for anyone listening to this that we are having this chat next to a building site which is louder today than it's ever been. Um, what is rewarding about the work that you do? Well, I'd say I've kind of set the scene with the gloomy, the gloomy, uh, you know, challenges. But at the end of the day, despite all of those, Edinburgh is a prosperous city and, you know, uh, a city of opportunity. Uh, mentioned Brexit too, but it means that, you know, things like that also mean that perhaps employers are looking in places they never used to in the past. Eh? Uh, so I'd, I'd say that the, the real rewarding thing is when people, you get somebody coming in with a bit of fear in their eyes, but you can see an appetite, a bit of fear and a bit of fire at the same time. Eh? Uh, certainly my time as a caseworker, you know, I, I would know, you would have an instinct of you know who actually means it and you know who's who's there to keep other people happy be they social workers or family members or partners or whatever like that but you would see you would see that kind of mixture of like trepidation of but you know eagerness in people and, and if you wake up a year two years five years later and that person's now a peer you know 
they're working in an organization around you know you know in the field or they're working in any kind of setting then that's uh, uh, i mean it sounds corny but that's that's the you know and everybody says you know if you had a pound for every time anybody said oh your work must be so challenging but rewarding but uh, it, people say that for that kind of cliche for a reason mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's the nice thing because that means that when you're done with this line of work there will be people there that you know can be your legacy and your mm -hmm. organization's legacy and uh, i dare say be far better at doing the same kind of work than you are yourself because they've they've overcome you know obstacles that you didn't and and gratifyingly there's so many people that, that we know and we can name that are in that boat now that are working for other organizations i bump into people all the time Dear literally nice. that that you know and i have to admit at, at my age you know sometimes it takes a few minutes to recognize them but i always do i all you know the, the name always comes back and it may be from a, a short six month period they had in one of our classes 15 years ago but they remember it and, and often they'll say that that was the kind of catalyst for what they did next nice. and yeah, so so that's a that's, that's a, a really nice thing to do because you didn't realize this was happening behind the scenes but somebody just somebody just got up off their off their knees and you know bounced back mm -hmm. now that's cool but, but the most important thing is to make sure that the standards are still high and the opportunity is still good so you can create your next bunch of people you know yeah. your superstars so to speak you know rather than dining out on stories from you know mm -hmm. people from x years ago so so i think for all the staff you know if, if, if all the staff were sitting here they, they would say the same mm -hmm. kind of thing and they may have some different things that that inspire them or you know make them feel glad they're doing what they're doing but the, the main thing is especially if maybe the people you've worked with certainly in, in my time when I was supporting people, the, the, the people I remember the fondest were the peoples where we actually did have some troublesome moments. People, you know, you've been on the edge of something, they end up back in jail. Yeah. And, you know, you couldn't be more frustrated, you couldn't be angrier. I dare say they always feel the same. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when, when, when they do get it and do bounce back and you've helped them do that, that means far more than if it was just some... Uh, fairy tale story where everything landed right first time you know that's mm. that, that's good too but you know it's less 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 meaningful for everybody I think. yeah that's very special and i don't think corny at all and really important yeah. what would help you in your role or what would help in your organization so would it be funding or i think funding comes up a lot for everybody is there anything that would be helpful well, I mean, I'm no expert on funding. Uh, there's, there are other people <laughs> uh, that could, could talk better about that. But obviously, the, the, the funding is important. We're very fortunate with most of the projects. Well, for, you make your own luck. Uh, but but the standards that, you know, my colleagues, my own managers that uh, pursue the funding, you know, and take a, a great responsibility for that, they're, they're, they're very... Uh, experienced and skilled at that so uh touch wood but you know i think we're in in, in a, a decent place with that and I, I think we're all aware that it's not important to just chase more funding just for kicks just mm -hmm. because you can so i think we're you know quite selective sure. with what will actually work uh, versus still having an eye on things that will actually be interesting and mm -hmm. different uh, so so I don't think I need to say much too much about the funding because we're certainly not I, I could be speaking to you next February or March when we've had a run of bad luck with that and it could you know the same discussion could be a cry for help so sure. it's not to say there's no complacency here but I think the thing main thing would be just uh, the thing that does help is having really good quality partners educate people in education and then opportunity providers who are genuine about supporting the, the people that we're trying to help yeah. and it's also it's obvious for me to say here just to keep everybody sweet but you know having funders are more kind of niche based like the edinburgh trust a eh, to, to fill in the gaps for things 
because you know our, our larger funders you know central government local government you know they give us some money and we're expected rightly to to run everything with it but things things come up particularly for our students where we might think well we can't necessarily justify x hundred pound or even a four figure sum for things like that so actually having more funds like that rather than putting all the onus on edinburgh trust would be a good you know we, we talked before this discussion about another fund that's no longer here locally in, in scotland and you know that's you know, if you ask me what's needed, it needs to come back. You know, sure. things things like that need to come back because yeah. they were useful and they they were there around for 25, 30, mm -hmm. you know. I, I I used one in the mid-90s when I, I was, when when I was long term unemployed yeah. in, in mm -hmm. Edinburgh to, 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 to do a, a computer course and yeah. things like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, rather than uh, these things disappearing, you know, it was 200, I think it was 150, 200 pound when I used it. So it's, Yeah, it was 150, you know, I think, when that? I used it, yeah. Aye. So, so these kind of things are, are really handy. And, and also, as I was saying about 10 minutes ago, having some sort of equity in the labour market and a uh, uh, grown-up attitude towards risk and things like that when it comes to people going for opportunities and... and, and people being treated humanely, even if they're not going to get the opportunities people to be given, you know, treat, treated fairly when it comes to their, you know, brave decisions to, you know, to, to start work for the first time since they've been in prison or, you know, to start work for the first time they've been in life because, the first time in their life because, you know, they've, they've, they've had to use drugs, you know, since, since school. So that's the thing that they would mean most. A lot of people kind of flatter to deceive because they want, we have lots of people come to us now, employers wanting something really quick and we're in their face. They, they have a, a problem that needs solved, you know, as far as staffing is concerned. And because we're not a large scale organisation, we perhaps aren't able to respond immediately with what they need. And then before you know it, you know, the phone's gone quiet mm -hmm. and the emails aren't being answered. So yeah. it's it would be nice to have more people more schemes more more opportunities where there is some sort of a uh, uh wage incentives on the behalf of employers to take people on now these things have come and gone over in in, in my time uh, with access to industry and sometimes they've been uh earmarked for age groups and things like that particularly young people which is cool but it, it would be nice if there was more uh, money being spent to actually encourage everybody to work together to make uh, openings uh, affordable and av available for people that need them the most because yes. you know that kind of affirmative action is only going to help us all if the, if the people we support are paying tax rather than uh, mm -hmm. you know sustaining themselves entirely on benefits. Yeah. My next question was about your hopes for the future for your work and for the people you support. I think you You've actually kind of answered that. Um, well, was there anything else that you'd like to add in there? I think you're right. I would just, I would just, I hate to waffle because I'm probably waffled enough, but no, I hate I to waffle was... just for the sake of it. But yeah, I think I've, I've summarised that. More, more of the same. You know, the, the kind of things I've just suggested aren't necessarily unaffordable or, or difficult to put together. Uh, and I think most people, you know, if they were sitting in my seat right now, would be nodding their heads too. It's just, you know, uh, it would be nice to have the powers to be that be doing that. But I understand that the country, the city, and everybody who are skint at the moment. But you know, we're we're, we're putting an economic. There's an economic argument for this as well as a social argument, sure. and everybody knows that that you know, if you invest money in this type of work then, you know, it does pay itself back very quickly. Yeah. So we've come to our last question. What does Edinburgh mean to you? Well, I, 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 pondering on, on this one, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Because I'm I'm, I'm an immigrant from across the world, albeit the, the water is Fife, <laughs> it's the fourth. <laughs> uh, so... Edinburgh means a lot of different things, doesn't it? And uh, since I moved to Edinburgh about 20 years ago, it's, it's meant different things. Uh, even since then, I think Edinburgh is going through a funny 
phase at the moment. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it's a, it is a, a small medieval city, but it does feel that, you know, it's perhaps gasping for breath at the moment, yeah. you know, it, because of its popularity. And I, I'm part, one of the reasons for that. I'm one of the prob, I, I'm, I'm one of the people to blame for this because it's a, there's, there's, there's a beauty and attraction to the city, but there's also, it's also really going to be interesting to see what Edinburgh looks like. Having been here in 20 years, if, 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 if we're lucky to be around in 20 years to just see what the city is going to look like, because, uh, the, you know, obvious examples being like the housing crisis here, mm -hmm. which, you know, un unless you're one of the more fortunate people, is is a, a crip crippling, you know, it's crippling for a, a working stroke middle class family, maybe like the one I've got and a lot of people like us, but it must be utterly demoralising for people that, you know, are having to get by in unstable, you know, circumstances and even having a, you know, what we would have called in the old days a decent income. Yeah. You know, means that you're you're a redundancy or a, a relationship breakup away from having to be, you know, a grown adult trying to find a room in a shared flat, yeah. or living in a, you know, Fife or Lanarkshire or something like that, and and, and spending you know twenty percent of your your earnings commuting and things things like that too so it's mm -hmm. a it's a funny one i'd love it i'd love it to have given you a really a, a kind of emotional a uh, you know beautiful uh, you know answer to that like i was like the mahar or mahar or something like that but it's the reality and i have to say it because a lot of people feel it is that it's it's a particularly difficult city to, to live in if uh, yeah. you know things aren't going too well for you especially especially in in you know, like most people in this business, you know, we're not particularly political or anything like that. Uh, I think it's there's more to it than that. It's just that it's a it's difficult when there's so much prosperity rubbing you in the face in a city like Edinburgh, and uh, you know, it, it's usually you know it, it quite at odds with your own situation because because we're trying to help people obviously, but how. We can understand why people might not want to trade in their benefits and especially their housing benefits for you know what could be a, a relatively modest income at work yeah but that's accompanied by a huge rent bill that makes the work seem you know like it wasn't a good idea in the first place that's a really important point mm -hmm. that you've made um and what i love about this question is that um like everyone's answer is so different it's so different and I think as someone like myself who, I mean, I'm not from Edinburgh, I'm from Ireland and moved over from Dublin 22 years ago. I can see a little bit of myself in every single answer, yeah. every single uh, person that's answered this question. So, um, but I think it is a very important point to make that, you know, we have a housing crisis in Edinburgh and that rents are going through the roof. So yeah. um, it's an important point. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your time and your honesty and your great conversation if someone wants to learn more about the work that you do how could they do that well they could simply uh, go on accessed industries website accessedindustry.co.uk uh, we also have a facebook twitter and instagram accounts to that effect or they can contact accessed industry a uh, our phone number is on our website too my name is mark phillips and i'm always happy to speak to people or indeed invite them in if they'd like to have a look around and see especially if they've got something they can offer us or they think that we can offer them uh we you know we do, we do all sorts so it's, it's all there on the website and if, if there's anything that's missing then just give us a call or uh, or email the uh, the info number which you'll find on our own page too and I'd, I'd, I'd be really happy to speak to anybody that's interested enough to sit through the 20 30 minutes of your <laughs> rambling you know if you've done that then you, you at least need to probably get in touch with me so i can apologize to you, so. <laughs> not at all mark it's been an absolute pleasure and thanks again for your time pleasure thank you this interview was carried out and produced by me 
Ems Harrington, Senior Partnership Development Officer at the Edinburgh Trust. The Edinburgh Trust is part of national poverty charity Turn To Us and we have over a decade of experience in giving direct financial support to people experiencing poverty in Edinburgh. You can learn more about our work by going to turntous.org.uk.